grader. I focus on um, social history and especially women's history and March is Women's History Month. So we are always interested in pulling women's history stories from our collections. Um, but as many people know, it can be kind of hard. Women's stories are often underrepresented in museum collections, and ours is no different. That's something that we work on every day, uh, trying to build our collections that tell women's stories across New York State. Um, but we do have a lot of stories of women who were donors, who helped build the collections here at the museum, um, who were trying to preserve the stories of their families, their communities, uh, and the different organizations that they worked as a part of. Uh, and these have been really important for building our collections and helping us tell different and diverse stories. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of those for you today and show you some material from our collection uh, that we don't get to see all the time. The first major group is the Shakers, um, and we can see an image of Shaker women here uh, working on making bonnets and hats. Um, it, at the turn of the 20th century, the Shaker population was really dwindling. Um, there was uh, less and less members at some of the communities. In 1892, Groveland, which was located in um, Livingston County in western New York closed down and the remaining Shakers from there moved to Water Valeet um, and then over time their population shrank and shrank and the, pop the Shakers themselves were thinking about their history and how they might preserve it. Uh, so they begun a relationship with the New York State Library which is also under the New York State Education Department as is the New York State Museum and because they already had that re relationship going trying to preserve some of their manuscript materials, their diaries and their paper materials. Um, they began talks with Charles C. Adams, who was the director of the New York State Museum from 1926 to 1943. Um, they were interested in preserving their community and being able to tell their stories even after they were gone. Um, he also had a connection with William F. Winter, who was a photographer from Schenectady, New York. Um, Winter was going into the Shaker communities, especially Water Valite, to photograph them, um, to photograph the way that the buildings were set up, the way the materials were seen in them. And uh, this partnership between the Shaker women, William Winter, and Charles Adams was really important because it preserved the stories of the artifacts that ultimately came to the museum. And the museum collected a number of different things, uh, finished goods, tools, machinery, and raw materials. Um, so we could tell a broad range of stories about the Shakers. Uh, ultimately, all this collecting led to an ex exhibition at the New York State Museum in 1940. And Shaker women were so vital in this effort, both for getting the materials to the museum, but also providing context about what the materials were, how they were used, um, and they did two different things. In some cases, they donated items. Um, this is especially true for the raw materials. Um, but the Shaker women had really good business sense. So sometimes they also purchased or sold materials to the museum. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the next image we'll see is of Sister Jenny Wells um, in the center. Uh, she was a major donor and seller to the museum. Um, she, as I said, had really good business sense, as the Shakers did, so she sold materials that were of a high market value at the time, but she also donated a lot of materials and provided a lot of context for them. Uh, there is a letter from her to Charles Adams right before he retired when he was still collecting from the Shakers, and she was frustrated with him because she felt that his offer of $7.50 for a collection of wooden patterns when John S. Williams, who was the founder of the Shaker Museum, would pay out the full price of $25 was clearly unjust. Um, so there was a little back and forth between these two institutions that were both collecting at the same time. Uh, in, on July 18, 1938, Eldress Anna Case died at Water Valite, and that led to the three remaining South family Shakers moving to Mount Lebanon. So we have even more consolidation. Um, the New York State Museum continued to collect um, a large collection of furniture that was built earlier at Groveland came to the museum, um, all made by Emery Brooks. And from 1939 to 1942, there was another big period of collecting, um, which ended in 1943 with the retirement of Charles Adams. Um, we have one more image showing Sister Sarah Collins working on a chair. 
Um, and this is another great resource. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to pull this chair today, but we do have this chair in our collection and um, some of the raw materials that she would have used for making it, the tools and the chair itself, as well as the photograph of her working um, in a Shaker workshop. So there are a number of women whose names appear over and over again in our Shaker collections. Um, Eldress Anna Case of Water Valite, Sister Jenny Wells, um, from Water Valit, uh, who had lived in Groveland before that, Eldress Rosetta Stevens and Eldress Ella Winship, both from Mount Lebanon, who also both had originally been from Groveland, Sister Alice Smith from Hancock Village, just over the border in Massachusetts, Sister Lillian Barlow from Mount Lebanon, Sister Aida Elam from Canterbury, New Hampshire, and Eldress Emma Neal and Sister Sadie Neal, uh, both from Mount Lebanon and both actual sisters. So let's take a look at some of the materials that come from our collection. Um, of course, Shakers, well known for their chairs, um, and we have this wonderful example. Um, this was donated by Sister Jenny Wells, who we had seen in the earlier image. And then sitting on it, you can see some of the raw material, the splats that were used for the, the seat of this chair. Um, and these were donated by Sister Lillian Barlow. In terms of finished materials, we have also a basket and a box. Um, the basket was a purchase from Sister Rosetta Stevens and the box a purchase from Alice M. Smith. And as I mentioned, um, the Shakers were very aware of the market for their materials at this time. So when there was a piece that would sell um, for good market value, they offered it to the museum for sale. Um, the materials that documented how they were made tended to be donated. Um, we do have a couple more materials used for making things. Um, we have a pair in the front of mitten stretchers or mitten menders, um, one donated by Sister A.M. Elam and one donated by Sister Sadie Neal from Mount Lebanon, as I mentioned before. Um, the one here, uh, which is the one from Sister Elam, is really interesting because it has a marking in pencil indicating how it was used. And these kind of notes exist throughout the collection, um, explaining where the materials came from, who used them, and how they were used. Um, we do also have a pair of spools for thread that was made by the Shakers, and um, those came from Sister Jenny Wells from Waterville Elite. So moving on, our next collection uh, will jump forward into the mid 20th century. Uh, and the next woman donor I'd like to talk about is Marion Weber Welsh. Um, you can see her here on a vehicle called the Webermobile um, in the um, entranceway to our museum when it first opened in 1976, um, the opening of the Cultural Education Center. Uh, this was one of the first exhibits that we had up at that time. The car itself was built by her father and both Marion and her mother, Pauline, were responsible for donating a large collection documenting the work of both Marion herself and her father. Um, so Marion was an industrial designer. She was known for her metalware, um, including flatware and tableware, and we can see some of those here. She worked for um, Echo and Samuel Kirk and Son when she was designing flatware. Um, she was also known for her costume jewelry and her buttons. Um, her buttons were pr produced by La Mode, um, as were some of the, the um, pins that you see here, the decorative costume jewelry. Uh, her buttons are fanciful. Uh, they include images of fruit and flowers and even bread. Um, she opened her own design firm in Manhattan in 1939, and she holds over 25 patents for her design work. Um, so she was a really well-known designer um, internationally. She was interested in um, uh, preserving her legacy as well as her father's. So she donated her own work, not only here at the New York State Museum, but at the Albany Institute and also at the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York City. In terms of her father, Christian Weber, uh, Christian was a engineer. Um, he began designing a hydrocarbon engine while he was working for GE in Schenectady. Um, and later he left to open his own bicycle business where he continued designing and building automobiles and also worked as a dealer for various automobile firms. Um, so the early donations that we have 
of Christian Weber's materials mostly came from Pauline Weber, uh, Pauline Paul Weber. Um, and they included one full and two partial cars, um, as well as the parts that went along with them. Um, we can see in the image here uh, that uh, we have a duster and a hat that were worn by Pauline. So when Christian Weber designed a car, he actually um, took her in a honeymoon trip in that car. And this is the duster and the hat that she wore on that journey. Um, these materials were donated by Marion herself. Immediately following Christian's death, his commercial property, uh, which was located on Central Avenue, went into foreclosure, which led Pauline to donate a lot of the materials to the New York State Museum. Um, she knew it was an important story. He was one of the first automobile dealers in Albany and the first to build a car here. Um, so she wanted to preserve it in some way, and she didn't have a lot of time to get it out of there. So it, it came to the music museum very quickly and um, in a very rushed manner. That first accession, um, and we number our collections accessions by the year they came in, is labeled 1933.6 and includes over 800 items. Um, so that was a lot of things that came all together um, through the 1930s. Later, Marion actually came to the museum and tagged and labeled those materials so that we know what they are, um, which is really helpful to have those stories. Um, one item that we have from Christian Weber is this uh, machine model. Um, this was a steam engine model that was built by Christian Weber Jr. and exhibited at the World's Columbian Exhibition as well as at the Pratt Institute where he studied. Um, so we have everything from his small models up to his big vehicles. Uh, we do also have a collection of pins and buttons related to the various automobile shows and clubs that he was involved in throughout the Capital District. Um, not only was he building his own cars and then working as a dealer, but he was also um, exhibiting and um, having a really active voice in the automobile world, uh, which was a new and very exciting thing in Albany at the time. And I just want to mention um, Marion Weber, her, her um, influence was so important to the museum. A book was written by our previous curator, Jeffrey Stein, about the Weber Mobile and focused on Christian Weber. And in the front he wrote, Marion G. Weber Welsh, Christian F. Weber's daughter, through preservation of artifacts, records, and knowledge, made possible this book documenting portions of her father's life as an inventor and entrepreneur. In the early 1930s, Marion identified Christian Weber artifacts given to the State Museum. She remained dedicated to preserving the Weber history through a bequest in 2000. As a former curator at the New York State Museum, I remain grateful, having learned much from Marion Weber during my contacts with her over a quarter century. I encountered Weber artifacts early in my career at the State Museum. In 1970, I contacted Marion and her sister Gretchen to see if I could learn more about Christian and to ask about other artifacts that might have survived. From that point, the Weber Museum collection grew with additional artifacts and information about Christian. Um, so Jeffrey Stein's book really um, relied on the information and the context that Marion was able to provide about her family's donations um, and the materials that she herself gave to the museum. So finally, we're going to jump forward a little bit further later into the 20th century um, to 1982. And the last donor that I would like to talk about today is Pam Elam. Um, Pam first approached us while we were working in 2017 on an exhibit focused on the centennial of women's suffrage. And she said, I have materials related to the push for um, passage of the ERA. And you can see the image here. Um, that is Pam standing at the center of the protest with the microphone. Um, Pam and some women that she worked with in New York City and Washington DC formed a group called the Second Congressional Union. Um, the First Congressional Union was a women's suffrage group um, that worked before the passage of the 19th Amendment. And they, um, the Second Congressional Union, would, Union was formed when the ERA was about to run out of time. Um, if it was not passed by enough states, not ratified, it would just go away. Um, and so this group was formed to push for ratification um, and to hold a number of protests in Washington, D.C., centered really on suffrage history, um, looking at, uh, they would hold protests on the birth of Susan B. Anthony or the birth date of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, they burned 
Ronald Reagan in effigy, just as the suffragists had burned earlier presidents in effigy. Um, so they were really very history-minded in their protests. And this collection includes um, images of those protests, wonderful documentation telling us about when they happened and how they happened. And here you can see the flag of the Second Congressional Union, um, which is copied from the suffragists, the same colors, the yellow, uh, white, and purple. Uh, and you can see another photograph of their um, protests and also a um, set of handcuffs and an arrest ticket from Pam Elam, uh, arrested for protesting on the streets of Washington, DC. We've continued our relationship with Pam and she has really helped us build our collections as they relate to women's history and LGBTQ plus history. Um, so I wanna share a couple more of those materials with you as well. Uh, the shirt here uh, is one of her favorites from her collection. It's from an organization called Lesbians in City Government. And um, this was a group that worked to get visibility for LGBTQ plus rights in city government in New York City. Um, and eventually they worked uh, more on the state level as well. Um, it was important to have LGBTQ plus representation in the halls of government if they were going to get laws passed that would protect their rights. Um, so this was a really important step in that. Um, we also have a shirt from Pam's work with the um, campaign of Tom Dunn uh, for New York State. Uh, or, uh, this is for his congressional run, um, but she did also donate materials and work on his run for New York State. Um, Tom, Tom Dunn was the first openly um, HIV positive and LGBTQ plus legislator in the New York State Assembly. Um, so we have materials related to his run as well. Um, Pam also collected other women's history and um, helped fill our collections with those as well. You can see some materials related to Hil Hillary Clinton. Um, these all from her 2016 run for president. Um, but the collection also includes materials um, from her earlier um, work in politics as well. And finally, um, in addition to women's history, we've been working very much on building our sports history collections. And Pam was able to give us these materials related to the WNBA team, the New York Liberty. Um, we have tickets and um, season schedules and shirts and um, other ephemera as part of the collection as well. So you can see today we've told uh, really diverse stories of women's history. Um, we certainly are still lacking in our collections in the way that we can tell women's history, um, the materials that we have. Um, we would like to see more diversity and, and we would like to see more women's stories from across the state and from across different time periods. But as we look into our collections and we look at these donors who were women, if we start to dig a little deeper, we see more and more women's stories emerge, um, some that we didn't even realize that we had. So I hope that uh, you are all looking at women's history this month, um, thinking about it, thinking about what those stories can tell us. Um, I hope if you have some great stories that you might be willing to share them with the museum. And um, I'm happy to take any questions now or uh, later if you leave them in the comments.